Hello everyone. Today we're starting on a topic called applications of the photoelectric effect. In this topic we'll both be learning about some applications of the photoelectric effect which we've learned about as well as uh, some of the effects of science on the real world as has happened historically. So to start uh, we'll be talking about photoelectric cells and here we'll be learning about uh, the uses of turning light energy into electrical energy. Here we can see a solar powered car, which is of course one use of photoelectric cells. So a photovoltaic cell, uh, we can see one here, is a photoelectric circuit that produces a photocurrent when struck by photons. And so of course we've learned about this in the photoelectric effect. We get photons uh, creating movement in electrons, which of course causes a current. These devices can be used to measure light intensity because obviously light of greater intensity will produce a greater photocurrent. Uh, they can also be used to charge capacitors or batteries. A capacitor is a device that slowly absorbs uh, energy and then releases it all at once. And so if we have a, uh, a photovoltaic cell producing even a very small current, it can charge a capacitor, which can then later be used to release a lot of energy all at once. Now the efficiency of a photovoltaic cell is measured as a percentage. And in this instance, uh, we have a particular definition of the word efficiency. We find that it shows how much light energy is converted into electrical energy. So, for example, a 100% efficient cell converts all light energy into electrical energy. A 50% efficient cell uh, turns exactly half of the light energy into electrical energy. So most cells have an efficiency of about 12 to 18%. That means between 12% and 18% of the incoming light energy is turned into electrical energy. The best solar cells in the world have an efficiency of more than 40%, but still less than 50%. So as you can imagine, it's pretty hard to turn light energy into electrical energy. In the past, photovoltaic cells were constructed in vacuum tubes. We can see a picture of one here. They were called photocells, and they use the photoelectric effect as we've learned about. They simply use ultraviolet light shining onto an electrode, which is the metal rod in the middle of this vacuum cell, uh, to generate electrons, which of course is a photocurrent. Today though, photovoltaic cells use semiconductors. Uh, some common semiconductors are silicon and gallium arsenide. And these operate in a slightly different way, but it's still the sort of same basic principle. So they respond uh, both the photovoltaic cells that we use today and the photocells that we used uh, a few decades ago respond best to ultraviolet light because of course this light has the most energy. So let's talk about some uses. Cameras and photo photographers use photocells to measure ambient light intensity. So we can see a light meter over here. It has a little uh, photovoltaic cell right on the top. That's where the little white circle is and it tells you how intense uh, the ultraviolet light from the sun is. And so this lets uh, photographers and so on determine the correct camera exposure. Obviously, if you have a very bright light source, you don't need to uh, have a very long exposure because the camera gets uh, enough light in it, even from a short exposure. Most cameras today set the exposure automatically. They have a little built-in photocell that detects the outside light. However, there are some professional photographers who prefer to set it manually because it gives them greater control over exactly how much light there is in the photograph. So, those are light meters. Now on to burglar alarms. Uh, photovoltaic cells aren't used like this very often anymore, but it's still a use. So in a burglar alarm, we can see a schematic of one here. We can have a little uh, ultraviolet light source over here which beams light to a photocell. Uh, the photocurrent from the photocell energizes an electromagnet, which we can see here. Obviously, we have to have some sort of amplifier in the circuit because otherwise the photocurrent produced will be very, very small. But I've left that out of the diagram for clarity. So the electromagnet, as we can see here, is holding open a switch. The switch is spring-loaded, so if the electromagnet is suddenly deactivated, the switch will fall into place and complete the bottom circuit. And so when the light, the ultraviolet source here, is blocked, then the photocell stops producing a photocurrent, and so the electromagnet stops being a magnet, and the spring-loaded switch at the bottom suddenly closes, and this completes the bottom circuit and activates the alarm. 
And so we can tell when, say, a burglar has walked across the ultraviolet light source. There's usually also some extra circuitry that means that uh, even once the light continues to activate the photocell, if the alarm started going off, it'll continue to go off. Breathalyzers are another use of uh, photo photovoltaic cells. So in breathalyzers, UV light is beamed through a solution inside the breathalyzer called potassium dichromate. Potassium dichromate is a very useful substance because it changes color when it's exposed to alcohol vapor, say in the breath of a person using the breathalyzer. So a photocell can detect a color change because obviously the energy of the photons getting through will be slightly different when the uh, potassium dichromate is a different color. And so with a little chip or something inside the breathalyzer, it can estimate how much alcohol is in the user's blood level. Uh, and so um, obviously if there's a lot of uh, alcohol in their blood, then there'll be a lot of alcohol vapor in their breath. And so there'll be a greater color change in the, in the potassium dichromate than if they're sober, for example. Uh, a final use is in solar cells, which is probably something you've heard of before, obviously. Solar cells convert solar energy, that is, energy from the sun, into electrical energy. They consist of two plates, sort of sandwiched together, one on top, one on the bottom, each one containing a different type of semiconductor. We'll learn more about semiconductors in a different module. This is called a PN junction. So the P is for the positive type semiconductor and the N is for the negative type semiconductor. So the electrons in the cell are excited by uh, ultraviolet photons from the sun, because obviously the sun is a great emitter of ultraviolet light. Now the PN junction, which I mentioned before, which is the two semiconductors sandwiched together, limits the photoelectron flow to one direction so that the uh, photons can't flow backwards. And this means uh, that the photoelectrons flow in just one direction and produce a voltage between the top plate and the bottom plate. This voltage can be used to power electrical devices. In, in fact, in this picture of a calculator, we can see just a tiny little sort of uh, grid of photovoltaic cells right at the top there. And these are, in fact, examples of solar cells. They're just sandwiched together uh, semiconductors, which, when ultraviolet light from, say, the sun shines on them, can charge the battery inside them. And it means that you can continue using these calculators for a long time without having to worry about charging the batteries yourself. This concludes the theory. Today we've learned about uh, some of the various uses of uh, photovoltaic cells in the world around us. Let's go on to some questions. Question 1. What does the efficiency of a photovoltaic cell refer to? Let's look at the options. Uh, first A, the rate at which it converts light into electricity. Now, in some physical topics, the efficiency does in fact refer to the rate at which something happens. But in this case, that's uh, not what the efficiency of a photovoltaic cell refers to. Is it then the price of the photovoltaic cells? Well, that's not really it either. Efficiency in terms of cost is more sort of an economics thing and we're dealing with physics here. Uh, the ease with which it can be manufactured? Well, that's sort of the efficiency of manufacturing. It's not the efficiency of the photovoltaic cell. So our last option is the fraction of light energy that it converts into electrical energy. And this is in fact the correct answer. So if a cell is 100% efficient, it converts all light energy into electrical energy, and if it's 0% uh, efficient, it converts no light energy into electrical energy, and isn't really a photovoltaic cell. Question 2. What is the average efficiency of the various different photovoltaic cells on today's market? We have four options here, going from about 12% to about 36%. And it might seem at first that these three, uh, one of these three might be the correct answer because um, we know that it's quite difficult to convert uh, light into electricity and even the highest number we have here, 36%, is barely a third of the light energy being converted into electric energy. But as it turns out, none of these are co the correct answer. Certainly we've created photovoltaic cells with these efficiencies, 
but they aren't really available in today's market, and if they are, they're very expensive. So the average sort of efficiency is, is in fact, closer to about 12 to 18 percent, and we find that this is the correct answer. And that means that for the average uh, photovoltaic cell on the market, you can only get about a fifth of a light's energy uh, into electricity. Still, if you have enough light, you can produce a lot of energy, so it's not too bad. Question three. Name three applications of the photoelectric effect. Well, we've just gone through those in this slide, and so in fact I can name four for you. We can use them for light meters, which measure the amount of ambient light for things like photography. Burglar alarms, although that's not really a current use of the photoelectric effect. Breathalyzers, which can be used to analyze the amount of alcohol in someone's blood or breath. Or solar cells, which of course convert uh, energy from the sun into electrical energy. Question four. In which direction, if any, does conventional current flow in this diagram? So this is a diagram of a solar cell. We can see two semiconductors sort of sandwiched together here. One with an n-type semiconductor and one a p-type semiconductor. And so uh, the n-type semiconductor has lots of free electrons floating around. And this means that uh, when sunlight shines on it, then the electrons will flow from the n-type into the p-type semiconductor, which has holes that the electrons can fill up. So, if we have uh, electrons going from the n-type to the p-type, then we'll have a charge difference between them, and that will create a voltage. So in a p-n junction, electrons flow from the n-type semiconductor into the p-type semiconductor. So the n-type ends up with this charge, and the p-type ends up with this charge, because all the electrons have flown into it. So that means that the photoelectrons move anti-clockwise, which is in this direction. And so we can draw the direction of the electrons movement with little arrows here and here. But of course, conventional current doesn't flow in the same direction as electrons. Conventional current flows in the opposite direction, so it moves clockwise. We can see that in this circuit here, it's moving from the positively charged plate all the way around to the negatively charged plate, which is consistent with, with what we know of circuits. Conventional current, of course, always moving from the positive around to the negative. Question five. A certain photocell has a work function, which we've learned about before, uh, with this number. What is the wavelength of a photon at the threshold frequency? Use these values for H and C. Now, we know that to find the uh, energy of a photon at the work function, we can use this equation. Work function equals HF0. So F0 is the minimum frequency that a photon needs in order to eject an electron from the metal. So substituting in H and our work function, we end up with this equation here. Rearranging, we can find an expression for F0, which is the threshold frequency of the uh, photon that we're looking for. And this ends up being about 5.6 times 10 to the power 14 hertz, which is a number of uh, terahertz, I believe. All right, so now we have the threshold frequency. So we need to find the wavelength. Remember to, remember, to find the wavelength of a photon, we can use this equation. Wavelength equals the speed of light over the photon's frequency. We can substitute the speed of light and the photon's frequency to make the equation look something like this. And this, of course, will give us an expression for the exact wavelength of the photon. It ends up being 5.4 times 10 to the minus 7 um, meters. Normally, however, we measure photons of visible light in nanometers. So dividing by 10 to the minus 9, which is a nanometer, we end up with 540 nanometers, which is a green color. Now, as I said before, most photocells are only active in the sort of uh, ultraviolet frequencies. But in this case, a green photon is able to activate the photoelectric cell. And that's because this work function is actually quite a low one. Most metals have a much higher work function than this. 
This is, in fact, the work function of potassium. Uh, in one of the questions that we had on a previous slide, we saw that potassium has a lower work function than many, many other metals. And so green light is sort of the very, very uh, lower energy boundary that can be detected by a photocell. This concludes the questions. Today we've learned about photovoltaic cells and their applications, including in light meters, breathalyzers, and solar cells.